Second part of chapter one of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. The Flux First. In order to begin at the beginning, we must try to fall back on uninterpreted feeling, as the mystics aspire to do. We need not expect, however, to find peace there, for the immediate is in flux. Pure feeling rejoices in a logical non-entity very deceptive to dialectical minds. They often think, when they fall back on elements necessarily indescribable, that they have come upon true nothingness. If they are mystics, distrusting thought and craving the largeness of indistinction, they may embrace this alleged nothingness with joy, even if it seem positively painful, hoping to find rest there through self-abnegation. If, on the contrary, they are rationalists, they may reject the immediate with scorn and deny that it exists at all, since in their books they cannot define it satisfactorily. Both mystics and rationalists, however, are deceived by their mental agility. The immediate exists, even if dialectic cannot explain it. What the rationalist calls non-entity is the substrate and locus of all ideas, having the obstinate reality of matter, the crushing irrationality of existence itself, and one who attempts to override it becomes to that extent an irrelevant rhapsodist, dealing with thin after-images of being. Nor has the mystic who sinks into the immediate much better appreciated the situation. This immediate is not God, but chaos. Its nothingness is pregnant, restless, and brutish. It is that from which all things emerge in so far as they have any permanence or value, so that to lapse into it again is a dull suicide and no salvation. Peace, which is after all what the mystic seeks, lies not in indistinction, but in perfection. If he reaches it in a measure himself, it is by the traditional discipline he still practices, not by his heats or his languors. The seedbed of reason lies, then, in the immediate but what reason draws thence is momentum and power to rise above its source. It is the perturbed immediate itself that finds, or at least seeks, its peace in reason, through which it comes in sight of some sort of ideal permanence. When the flux manages to form an eddy and to maintain by breathing and nutrition what we call a life, it affords some slight foothold and object for thought, and becomes in a measure like the ark in the desert, a moving habitation for the eternal. Side note. Life the fixation of interests. Life begins to have some value and continuity so soon as there is something definite that lives and something definite to live for. The primacy of will, as Fichte and Schopenhauer conceived it, is a mythical way of designating this situation. Of course a will can have no being in the absence of realities or ideas marking its direction and contrasting the eventualities it seeks with those it flies from. And tendency, no less than movement, needs an organized medium to make it possible, while aspiration and fear involve an ideal world. Yet a principle of choice is not deducible from mere ideas, and no interest is involved in the formal relations of things. All survey needs an arbitrary starting point, all valuation rests on an irrational bias. The absolute flux cannot be physically arrested, but what arrests it, ideally, is the fixing of some point in it from which it can be measured and illumined. Otherwise, it could show no form and maintain no preference. It would be impossible to approach or recede from a represented state, and to suffer or to exert will in view of events. The irrational fate that lodges the transcendental self in this or that body inspires it 
with definite passions and subjects it to particular buffets from the outer world this is the prime condition of all observation and inference of all failure or success Sidenote, primary dualities those sensations in which a transition is contained need only analysis to yield two ideal and related terms two points in space or two characters in feeling hot and cold here and there good and bad now and then are diets that spring into being when the flux accentuates some term and so makes possible a discrimination of parts and directions in its own movement an initial attitude sustains incipient interests what we first discover in ourselves before the influence we obey has given rise to any definite idea is the working of instincts already in motion impulses to appropriate and to reject first teach us the points of the compass and space itself like charity begins at home Side note. first gropings instinct the nucleus of reason the guide in early sensuous education is the same that conducts the whole life of reason namely impulse checked by experiment and experiment judged again by impulse what teaches the child to distinguish the nurse's breast from sundry blank or disquieting presences what induces him to arrest that image to mark its associates and to recognize them with alacrity the discomfort of its absence and the comfort of its possession to that image is attached the chief satisfaction he knows and the force of that satisfaction disentangles it before all other images from the feeble and fluid continuum of his life what first awakens in him a sense of reality is what first is able to appease his unrest had the group of feelings now welded together in fruition found no instinct in him to awaken and become a signal for the group would never have persisted its loose elements would have been allowed to pass by unnoticed and would not have been recognized when they recurred experience would have remained absolute in experience as foolishly perpetual as the gurglings of rivers or the flickerings of sunlight in a grove but an instinct was actually present so formed as to be aroused by a determinate stimulus and the image produced by that stimulus when it came could have in consequence a meaning and an individuality it seemed by divine right to signify something interesting something real because by natural contiguity it flowed from something pertinent and important to life every accompanying sensation which shared that privilege or in time was engrossed in that function would ultimately become a part of the conceived reality a quality of that thing the same primacy of impulses irrational in themselves but expressive of bodily functions is observable in the behavior of animals and in those dreams obsessions and primary passions which in the midst of sophisticated life sometimes lay bare the obscure groundwork of human nature reason's work is there undone we can observe sporadic growths disjointed fragments of rationality springing up in a moral wilderness in the passion of love for instance a cause unknown to the sufferer by which is doubtless the spring flood of hereditary instincts accidentally let loose suddenly checks the young man's gaiety dispels his random curiosity arrests perhaps his very breath and when he looks for a cause to explain his suspended faculties he can find it only in the presence or image of another being of whose character possibly he knows nothing and whose beauty may not be remarkable yet that image pursues him everywhere and he is dominated by an unaccustomed tragic earnestness and a new capacity for suffering and joy if the passion be strong there is no previous interest or duty that will be remembered before it 
if it be lasting the whole life may be reorganized by it it may impose new habits other manners and another religion yet what is the root of all this idealism an irrational instinct normally intermittent such as all dumb creatures share which has here managed to dominate a human soul and to enlist all the mental powers in its more or less permanent service upsetting their usual equilibrium this madness however inspires method and for the first time perhaps in his life the man has something to live for the blind affinity that like a magnet draws all the faculties around it in so uniting them suffuses them with an unwanted spiritual light side note better and worse the fundamental categories here on a small scale and on a precarious foundation we may see clearly illustrated and foreshadowed the life of reason which is simply the unity given to all existence by a mind in love with the good in the higher reaches of human nature as much as in the lower rationality depends on distinguishing the excellent and that distinction can be made in the last analysis only by an irrational impulse as life is a better form given to force by which the universal flux is subdued to create and serve a somewhat permanent interest so reason is a better form given to interest itself by which it is fortified and propagated and ultimately perhaps assured of satisfaction the substance to which this form is given remains irrational so that rationality like all excellence is something secondary and relative requiring a natural being to possess or to impute it when definite interests are recognized and the values of things are estimated by that standard action at the same time varying in harmony with that estimation then reason has been born and a moral world has arisen end of chapter one